John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. After Jesus said this, he looked, forward, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. This is the word of God. My name is Jonathan Romig. I didn't introduce myself uh, during the baptism, but I'm the pastor here at Cornerstone. Thank you, Andy, for doing the the welcome to all of our first-time visitors. Happy you're here. Uh, This is a good night to be a a first-time visitor or, or coming to Cornerstone because we're starting a new series. We're starting a series called How He Prayed. We're talking about how Jesus prayed. Now, this is a three-week series, but we're actually looking at the Gospel of John, John chapter 17. Now, this is one of Jesus' most famous prayers, probably uh, the most famous prayer outside of the Lord's Prayer. And John chapter 17 is called the High Priestly Prayer of Jesus. Now, that's what we call it. The Bible doesn't label it that, but that's what we call it. Now, a priest, their job, their role was to come between God and people and to intermediate, to, to, to bring the relationship of God knowing his people. And we see Jesus doing just that. He is praying to the Father, and he's, he's praying on behalf of people. He's praying on behalf of himself. He's praying on behalf of his disciples. So he's standing in between, facilitating the relationship. So as we study this series, as we study John chapter 17, I hope that we will learn how we can be intermediaries, how we can pray to the Father on behalf of ourselves, on behalf of fellow Christians, and on behalf of others. And I think John chapter 17 is a great place to do this. Now, maybe you're wondering, well, why did Jonathan choose this series? Our loose kind of theme for the year is prayer and discipleship. If we're a church that does prayer and discipleship, we will be a huge success as a church. And I thought, you know, it might be nice to focus on Christ as we head towards Christmas. Kind of an Advent series. Advent starts next week, but this kind of kicks off the Christmas uh, series, the Christmas time. Now, after thinking about it, I realized this would also make for a great Easter series. (laughs) Because Jesus prays this prayer after the Last Supper. The Last Supper took place the night before he was crucified. So this is one of the last prayers of Jesus Christ. So this can make a good Christmas series, a good Easter series. But first, it's just a series on prayer and praying. So why don't you join me as I kick off this series with a prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that in this series you would show us your glory. I pray that in this series, we would experience your glory. Father, I pray that we would not go through a sermon series on prayer and leave it prayerless. Would this sermon series help us become a church that is known for prayer, for crying out to you, for calling out to you for all of our needs, for all of our desires, for the success of our ministry, for reaching Westford. Father, we need to experience your glory, and the way we're going to do that is through prayer. So help us become a praying church. Lord, would we encounter you? We want to encounter you not just to get all those other things, but we want to encounter you because we want to know you. We want to just be in relationship with you. Father, I pray that as we go through tonight's sermon, we would encounter your glory. Would we encounter you? It's in Jesus' name I ask all of these things. Amen. Now, prayer is an interesting thing. Prayer is talking to God. And if you knew you were going to die tomorrow, (laughs) what would you pray for? Oh, Father, I pray for a long life. (laughs) I pray to not die tomorrow. I pray that you would take me out of those circumstances. 
But Jesus, let's look at what he prays the night before he dies. In John 17, 1, in the first half of the verse, he prays this. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. So this is, this is kind of a signal that this is the, the hour of his final work. We're going to look at what he prayed in just a second. But he's looking towards heaven and he's praying. He's pouring out his heart and he's starting with, God, this hour has come. This moment has come. The cross has come. Now he's about to pray to glorify his father. He's not going to begin this prayer with, Father, would you deliver me from this hour? Now, when he goes to Gethsemane, he does pray something along those lines. If it's your will, would you take me from this? But not my will, your will be done. And here in this moment, he's just praying. Now, I feel like many pastors' favorite movie for illustrations is this movie, Braveheart. Maybe you've been in a sermon where a pastor has talked about Braveheart. Well, I'm a, you're about to be in that moment right now. <laughs> the Braveheart is the story of William Wallace here, uh, looking rugged, played by Mel Gibson. He rallies the Scottish troops against their English kind of captors, their English oppressors. But at the end of the movie, he has been betrayed, and he's about to be executed. So he's about to be put to death. And he's waiting in prison for his execution the night before. And he has a visit from his love interest in the story, the princess. She comes to him, and she gives him this sedative to drink, this, like, painkiller. And she gives it to him, makes him drink it, and then she kisses him to make sure that he has swallowed the sedative, and then she leaves. And then William Wallace turns and spits it out. And he spits out this sedative because he doesn't want to abandon his Scotland. He doesn't want to, to, to be weak and ask for mercy in a moment of courage when the final work is about to happen. Jesus, likewise, could have taken a sedative. He could have said, Father, spare me this pain. Make it hurt less. <laughs> Let me get away from this. But Jesus doesn't pray any of those things. He prays, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. Jesus doesn't pray for heavenly Tylenol. <laughs> he prays for glory, that God would be glorified through himself, that, that Jesus would be glorified in order that he could glorify the Father. Even this request that he would be glorified is not a selfish request because his purpose is to glorify his heavenly Father, God the Father. Maybe this prayer, how it's beginning, this focus on the Father reminds you of another prayer in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus prays this. He's teaching his disciples how to pray. And he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed means to make holy. Jesus starts the same way in John 17. Glorified be your name. So in both examples, Jesus begins by focusing on the Father's glory on honoring the Father instead of himself. So when we pray, as we apply this to our lives, how can we pray? Well, when we pray, we can begin with glory. Now, maybe some of you are thinking, well, what is glory? <laughs> I've thought that many times. And glory is a huge topic. It's a huge theme throughout the Bible. So I'm not going to be able to explain it all tonight. But the word itself means to honor or praise it has like this weightiness to the word, like a, 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 a presence, a presence coming into the room that is, that is heavy, that is, that is noble, that is big, that shines. The word glory is really a revelation. It's, it's a revealing of something. It's a revealing of something that is good, that is noble, that has good character, it's a recognizing of worth. So to give you an example of this, tonight this is the second movie illustration. I'm sorry. Uh, there's two movie illustrations. But the movie Glory, right? So this movie is called Glory. It's a good movie. I recommend it. It's about the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment. It's an all-black regiment. And through the story of, of this movie, it tells how they... They fought 
against the South. They fought against kind of slavery, but then they also fought against racism. And their final glorious moment when their character, their worth, their bravery, their honor is revealed comes at the end of the movie when they charge, uh, when they charge Fort Wagner in the face of incredible odds, and they face massive losses, and almost everyone dies. But in so doing, they reveal something about them, that they were the ones willing to go into the battle first, that, they were, that there was something courageous in them. So they were breaking kind of through the walls of the fort at the same time as they're breaking through the walls of racism that say, you're not good enough, you're worth nothing. There's a, there's a revelation, there's a revealing of courage. So what is glory? I'm going to define it today this way. Glory is God's presence revealed. So when Jesus prays, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you, he is praying that the the Father would reveal honor in Christ so that the, the Son may honor the Father. You all know this story, Uh, this takes place in the Old Testament, hopefully if you were here during our Exodus sermon series, you're familiar with it, Uh, the story of the golden calf. This is where kind of a theme of glory really breaks clearly into the Bible. The story of the golden calf takes place in the Old Testament at Mount Sinai. So the people have left Egypt, they've gone to Mount Sinai, they're stopping there and they're going to go to the promised land. God is making a new relationship with the Israelite people. God has made this relationship. He's given them the Ten Commandments. And then, uh, then Moses goes up onto the mountain. And as he's on the mountain for 40 days, the people uh, begin to freak out. <laughs> they begin to say, well, what happened to Moses? God must have abandoned us. And so they build this golden calf. <laughs> they build this golden calf and they begin to worship it. And God gets angry. Look at what I just did for you. I just delivered you out of evil, out of oppression, and you're returning to the gods of Egypt. And so God says, I'm going to destroy this entire people. And Moses, I'm going to raise up a new people through you because I'm done with these people. And Moses, what does he do? He acts just like Jesus in John chapter 17. He acts as an intermediary. He says, Father, have mercy. God, have mercy. Don't destroy your people. Come with us. Be with us. Have mercy. The people wail and they repent. And we see this, Exodus 33, 14. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. But Moses isn't satisfied because he wants something more. He wants a sign that God's presence will be with them. And so Moses prays this. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. That's a pretty bold prayer. After your whole people have rebelled, after they have worshipped this golden calf, to say, I don't, I don't just want you to be with us. I want you to show yourself to us. And this is how the Lord replies. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God puts Moses in this cleft in the rock, and then he passes by. We see this passage uh, reoccur again where he talks about God's goodness and his mercy. See, God's glory, there's an aspect of his physical presence, right? Right? But ultimately, it's about revealing God's character, his goodness, his compassion, his mercy. Glory is revealing who God is. Moses wants to see God's glory. Don't you want to see God's glory? Don't you want to see God's presence, his goodness, his compassion, his mercy? I don't know about you, but in this world, I want to see more of God's goodness. (laughs) I want to experience God's compassion, his mercy, his presence here. Now, we talk about God's glory all the time as a church, but do we really want to experience it? Do we want to see it? 
Have you ever wanted to see something in person because you knew it was greater in person than hearing about it or watching it on television? So I'm from Colorado, from Estes Park, up near Rocky Mountain National Park, and there is one thing that is so significant that I had never seen for many years, and that is the ocean. <laughs> there are no oceans in Colorado. And it was like 12 years before I got to see my very first ocean. Every year we would drive to Virginia to see my sister, but we wouldn't make it. It was like three more hours to the ocean. So we'd drive like 27 hours, but we wouldn't drive the final three hours to the ocean. So finally I convinced my parents, like, we need to go see this ocean. I hear it's like salty and it's big. Let's go see it. And so, finally, we did. We drove down to uh, Virginia Beach. And the first time I really saw the ocean was when we drove up onto the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. So, Colorado boy, suddenly surrounded by the Atlantic. It's on all sides. It's as far as I can see. Man, the ocean is glorious, isn't it? It's so much better in person It's so much better in presence than it is just talking about it or a postcard. This is a picture of Virginia Beach. See, this gives you a glimpse of the glory of the ocean, but it doesn't quite do it justice. After we drove off the, we we went over the bridge, a great bridge, and we drove to the beach, got out of the car, and got attacked by seagulls. But that was part of experiencing the ocean, right? The seagulls going down and touching the water. See, I didn't want to just look at the ocean. I wasn't like, all right, I'm done, I'm good, I've seen the ocean. You have to get out of your car. You have to get into the waves to really know the glory of the ocean. You have to to wade along the shoreline, (laughs) feeling the fear of an ocean that could pull you out. Do you want to get into the shoreline of God's glory? Do you want to get into the waves of God's presence? Do you want to know the glory? When we pray, God, show me your glory, we're saying, God, would you you take my knowledge of you from being this purely like intellectual I know about you to, Father, I know you. I've experienced you. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just talk about God. I don't want to just read the words and never experience God's glory. I want to experience my Heavenly Father. I want to experience Jesus. I want him to splash me with the waves of his glory. God, show me your glory. God, splash me with your waves. Soak me in your presence. So if that's your prayer to the Father, God, would you reveal your glory to me? How is God going to answer you tonight? How does he answer us in his word? Well, the Father says, have you seen my son? (laughs) If you want to experience my glory, have you seen my Jesus? See, God's presence is revealed in Jesus Christ. If you've ever wanted to see God, you have to look at Jesus. Jesus. Our foundation verse tonight talks about this. John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. See, Jesus, the son, reveals his father's glory. Jesus reveals his goodness his compassion, his mercy. Now this series is a Christmas series, right? This is where Christmas enters into our passage tonight. See, when Jesus became a babe, that glory in heaven was entering into this world and somehow that glory was veiled because when we looked at Jesus, he just looked like another man, but that glory entered into our world. 
And I still think that there is something glorious about Christmas. It's why I put my Christmas lights out way too early. <laughs> because there's just something wonderful about Christmas. People are happy and joyful. And yes, sometimes we get caught up in the consumerism. But it's amazing that like the whole world lights up <laughs> at Christmas time. God's glory is breaking into our world. God's presence is revealed in Jesus Christ. So how can we pray? If we can begin with glory, what does that mean for our prayers? Well, that means if we're going to follow kind of the, the, the model that Jesus lays down for us, we just begin our prayers by focusing on God instead of ourselves. I don't know about you, but when I pray, I tend to like say, Heavenly Father, and then I like launch into, here's all the things I want, here's all the things I need, here's my Christmas list, would you check it twice? <laughs> but instead, God calls us to, uh, Jesus models for us to focus on the Father. Father, hallowed be your name. This is about you, this, this world, this life, this existence. Everything is about you, Father. It's not about me. So when we pray, we can start by saying things like, Father, would you be glorified? Help me understand what that means, Father. Would, would, I, would, would your presence be revealed in this world? Would your goodness, your compassion, your mercy, your life-changing presence, would it be revealed in this world? God, would you use me to show others your glory? Would I reveal some of your goodness, some of your compassion, some of your mercy to this world? Show me your presence, Father, through Jesus Christ. I want to get to know him. I want to experience him. Help me understand your word. Help me understand this word that talks about Christ. This is how we can begin our prayers, by focusing on God instead of ourselves. We call this a God-centered prayer instead of a man-centered prayer. And what are we doing when we pray this way? We are asking God to lead us out into the glory of his ocean. Now, God's ocean is a, uh, God's glory is like this big thing, right? It's marvelous, it's glorious, it's too big, it's dangerous to go for a swim in the ocean. You can get swept away. In the same way, we can get swept away by God, by his glory. So what, what, what acts as our life preserver? <laughs> what allows us to, to get to know God's glory, to get to know God's presence without being destroyed? See, we're sinful beings, and if we're going to attempt to walk into God's presence, how can we do that? Well, we need a life preserver. One, we can begin with glory, but we can pray for eternal life. We come humbly before Christ Jesus, confessing our sins and asking him to give us eternal life. And I want us to focus on verse 2 for a moment, that eternal life is a gift. John 17, 2 says this, For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. So to experience God's glory safely, we need the gift of eternal life. And this is a gift. This isn't something you can earn. I really liked kind of uh, uh, Monique's illustration of viewing Christianity as like this grade or this, this assignment that you could do well at. You can't merit eternal life. So you, like, you can't get the merit badge of everlasting life. You can't get the employee of the month plaque for your entire life that will then take you safely into eternity. Eternal life is a Christmas gift. <laughs> what is the gift of eternal life? Well, eternal life is the gift of knowing the Father and the Son. One commentary I read made this point, that eternal life is not living forever. All right? Eternal life is not living forever. Eternal life is the result, uh, living forever is the result of eternal life. Eternal life is being in a relationship with the Father and with the Son. 
In John chapter 17, verse 3, we actually see the definition of eternal life in the Bible. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. See, it goes right back to that, not just looking at God, not just knowing about God, but actually knowing God. Now this word for know in Greek, it, it could mean purely intellectual knowledge, but that's not how John is using it here. John is using it more like how we talk about our family members. I I know my wife. My my wife knows me. I know my parents. Maybe you use this when you talk about knowing your children or knowing your, your siblings, your brothers, your sisters. You know their fears, their joys, what makes them laugh, what makes them cry, what they like, what they don't like. Does Jesus know you that way? Does the Heavenly Father know your fears, your joys? Does he know what you're going through? Do you let him know? Do you speak to him as you go throughout your day telling him about your life? Or is he more like a pen pal that you write every once in a while? I'll check in, but I'm not really in relationship with that person. I want to walk through life knowing Jesus. I want to have an intimate relationship with him. If you want to step into the the ocean of God's glory, it's a good thing. But if you say, you know what, I want to know God, but I'm not really into this Christianity thing. (laughs) I'm not really into, you know, attending church, to reading the the Bible. I just kind of want to know God in my own way. Well, that's dangerous. That's like going for a swim in the Atlantic by yourself out in the, the waves, to, to swim in God's presence apart from Christ will lead to drowning, will lead to the abyss. But in Christ, if you trust Christ, you can swim forever. And you can enter into the waters of baptism into Christ. I loved Monique's baptism today because she was Uh, symbolically entering into Christ, spiritually being plunged into Jesus. That is the safest place to be in the universe, to be in Christ. If you are interested in being a Christian, come talk to me after the service. I'd love to tell you more about how you can repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus. Come on in, the water is fine. Eternal life is the gift of knowing the Father and the Son. So we begin in glory. We begin with glory. We pray for eternal life. Eternal life is uh, knowing the Father and knowing the Son. So how can we close our prayers? Well, number three, we can close in praise. The right response to glory is what? It's praise. It's worship. See, when God's goodness is revealed, it makes us want to fall on our knees and worship God. John 17, 4 through 5 ends like this. It says, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. What does Jesus mean by he has finished his work? So it's the night before his crucifixion. I think he's talking about his whole life, that here now he has come to the end of his earthly ministry. So the work Jesus did that was good was revealing God's goodness, his mercy, and compassion. He revealed his goodness by preaching against sin and by forgiving sin. He revealed his mercy and his compassion by healing the blind and the lame and the mute inviting people into a relationship with his heavenly Father. And the the final work that he completes is about to happen the next day as he goes to the cross and pays the penalty for our sins, sacrificing himself for us so that we can experience eternal life, so that we can experience a relationship with our heavenly Father. The, The final words William Wallace yells in Braveheart are freedom. And in glory, that that regiment, they fought for freedom from oppression and from slavery. Jesus, as he goes to the cross, is fighting for our freedom. Our freedom so that we can experience the glory of God safely. So that we can experience his goodness. So I want to ask you a question tonight. Are you free? 
Are you free in Christ Jesus? Do you know the presence of God? Or are you held down by sin? Are you in bondage to sin? We want to experience the finished work of Christ, knowing the Father, knowing the Son, being in relationship with the Father and with the Son. Now, we can pray this way because of Christ's finished work. In other words, when we pray, we can begin with glory because of Jesus. Because Jesus stepped down out of his glory in heaven into this world. He veiled his glory and lived as a man among us. That's what Christmas is about. So we can pray for glory because Jesus left his glorious honor in heaven. Number two, we can pray for eternal life because Jesus sacrificed his life for us. We can have a relationship with the Heavenly Father because Jesus gave up his relationship with the Heavenly Father at the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we can close in praise because that is not the end of the story. Because Jesus rose from the grave and he ascended into heaven and he is now seated at the right hand of his Father. He's victorious. And that's why we can praise him. So this sermon is not a, well, you must begin with glory. You must pray for eternal life. You must close in praise. It's a can. You can do those things. You get to do those things. All because of Christ Jesus and what he has done for you, if you know him. If you don't know Jesus, I hope that you'll consider it tonight. Come talk to me. I want to introduce you to him so that you can enter into that relationship, so that you can experience glory. Now, if you're a Christian who has a hard time experiencing God's glory, come talk to me too. Let's walk through this together. I have a hard time. Let's get to know the Father together. Let's get to know Christ together. The best way to end a sermon on prayer is in prayer. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, would you show us your glory? God, we want to experience you. We want to experience your presence. God, would we experience your glory tonight? Would we experience your glory as we go through this week? Would you reveal yourself to us? Would we be in relationship with you? Would we know your love and would we give your love to others? Father, forgive us for all the ways that we want to glorify ourselves. Father, forgive us for praying with ourselves as our primary, I don't know, motive. Would you, and just being, being in your presence and knowing you, would you be our all? Would we bring you glory? Would we bring you praise? Father, thank you for the ways that you have already revealed your glory to Cornerstone. Through the worship, through our story, through tonight's baptism. God, you are glorious. We pray that as we give the offering tonight, that you would use our offering to bring yourself glory, to spread the name of Christ Jesus into this world. It's in his name we pray, amen.